Out of the various weapons created throughout humankind, perhaps the most potent weapon humans have ever created is the weapon of propaganda. Propaganda tool of information at times can extend to a greater power than any artillery or sword. Furthermore, throughout history, propaganda has catalyzed great atrocities because of its lies and harboring of hateful emotion. On the contrary, propaganda has also greatly benefited oppressed people when used for the means of virtuosity and truth. See, when we think of propaganda, we often think of an elite oligarchy controlling information and suppressing truth in order to have the masses bend to their will. And that notion is completely understandable given our history. But also, propaganda can be very good as many agents of human rights have used their truths in order to push for the advancements of a cause bigger than themselves. All that propaganda is, is the sharing, or more dramatically, the weaponization of information and it's up to the user, the content in the propaganda, and how the information is distributed that discerns whether or not their propaganda presented is malevolent or righteous. For example, clear instances of evil propaganda are usually seen in dictatorships or corrupt oligarchies where the top percentile of a country, usually third world, controls the masses through fear and persecution. Another clear example of this is Germany in the 1920s to late 1940s. All these examples show how with contents of fear, persecution, and hate, propaganda can be weaponized for evil. On a more positive note, we can also see examples such as during the Reformation, when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Thesis at the church in Wittenberg as a positive form of propaganda. With his thesis, Martin Luther started to expose the Catholic Church's abuses and corruption. Along with the help of the printing press, Martin Luther was able to translate the Bible in German so that everyone in Germany could discover the truth for themselves rather than have the control of information be in the sole hands of the Catholic clergyman. Another instance of propaganda used for good is with Gandhi, who used the press to show the world the abuse the British Empire was committing against India. Moreover, Martin Luther King Jr., with his marches, sermons, and speeches, was able to spread awareness for his cause for a better life for African Americans and equality. These three instances I just mentioned beautifully capture how propaganda can be used as a tool for good when its contents are virtuous, truthful, and made for a cause to benefit a large group of people in need of help. But I know what you're thinking, what does this have to do with Attack on Titan? Well, my answer is a lot. The world that Isayama created is fascinating for a multitude of reasons. His nuanced storytelling, his intricate characters, and his riveting world are sufficient enough to grip the enthusiasm of millions across the globe. However, even though Isayama's world has so many attractive conditions, to me, the most alluring facet to Isayama's work is the way in which he massively uses information and mysteries to build his world. With the utilization of these two devices, Asayama simultaneously builds his world and clutches the intrigue of the audience. The way in which he achieves this is through the means of withholding certain truths and on occasion teasing partial truths. Furthermore, with Isayama's continual teasing of half-truths, it becomes even more difficult to discern truth from fallacy. Now this, alongside the exposition narrated and discovered by his characters, the audience is in constant suspense and anticipation for the next truth. The mystery of what's in the Jaeger's basement is a clear example of this notion. This mystery was a plot point that anchored the series for three seasons, and honestly speaking, being able to maintain the interest of an audience for that long, all the while managing to supersede their expectations, is a feat that is colossal, no pun intended. I mean, this feat is something that writers have notoriously failed at over and over again. Stories that come to mind are Lost, Game of Thrones, the Star Wars sequel, and many, many more. Only a few shows that I know of have succeeded in the subverting of expectations so well. The ones that come to mind are Bleach with the famous Soul Society arc, the Code Geass finale, One Piece, Hunter x Hunter, and a small number of others. What I'm trying to articulate is that this task of subverting expectations while subseding those same expectations by light years is a task that is extremely difficult to pull off. 
and must be applauded to whoever manages to accomplish such an endeavor. But back to my main point. In the world that Isayama built, the most potent weapon is not Titans, not the omnidirectional gear, but the truth. And in this video, we will explore how Isayama's world building and characters use propaganda to make such a compelling story. The use of propaganda in Attack on Titan is immediate in its first episode. In the first episode, we are introduced to a truth that the whole citizenry is indoctrinated to believe, and to an extent, the audience is said to believe as well, as we don't discover the fallacies of this conjecture until much later in the series. The truth and context chronicled to the characters and us the viewers is that a hundred years ago, the Titans suddenly appeared resulting in the fall of humanity. Out of necessity, the last remnants of humankind built a new civilization within the walls to protect themselves from the ambiguous titan threat. But by building the walls, they also shut themselves off from the outside world. Therefore, it is presumed that the walls are meant for protection. However, our main character Aaron Yeager begins to do what other great revolutionaries do ask questions, and through his ponderance, he discovers an irony in having humanity kept inside walls. Aaron contemplates as to why there's a prohibition for citizens to traverse outside the walls, excluding the scout regiment. Through his paradigm, Aaron proposes the hypothesis that if all humanity is entrapped into one location, wouldn't that be more detrimental to the welfare of humanity, since their isolation makes for an easy target for an attack. Thus, instead of feeling protected, the perception is the opposite. Instead, there's an air of feeling like cattle awaiting their impending slaughter. Then, in a flash of light, Aaron's inquiries are proven to not be paranoia, but legitimate. As soon as the Colossal Titan makes his abrupt entrance, he smashes while Maria in a single strike leading a bevy of titans to wreak havoc inside the walls. Now the security once fell inside the walls quickly converts into chaos and uncertainty. The truth once universally accepted is now fragmented. The walls are not safe. The real truth revealed is that the walls instead are walls of imprisonment rather than walls for protection and that humans are fighting a losing battle against the titans. The military's efforts are futile, and the end of humanity is inevitable. Now the only thing left to ask is why. Why do the titans exist? Where do they come from? And why do they devour humans? These questions are what keep Aaron Yeager awake at night. Instead of falling into a state of hopelessness, he uses his anger as fuel to seek the truth, and with the truth, he hopes to exact revenge on the titans who robbed him of everything. Therefore, with Aaron's newfound purpose to discover the truth, he gets the gears turning for the game of propaganda. What Aaron will soon come to understand is that in this game, there are two sides. The side that holds the truth and controls it, and the side that seeks to break this control for freedom. Hence, the side that Aaron fights for is a side that seeks to break from the control from those that hold it over him and his people and to seek the truth for freedom. Freedom from his misery and imprisoned disposition. But with this great endeavor comes great resistance and only those who have the fortitude to endure this resistance will win in the end. In the first season of Attack on Titan, there are three plot points that are imperative to the series' real building and narrative. The first plot point that serves this design is when Eren is revealed to be a shifter which dawns upon a paramount paradigm shift in the story. The Titans before this shift were seen as enemies and mindless monsters. However, with Eren's mysterious abilities, nuance is added to this narrative. Titans are no longer seen as only mindless monsters, but now 
also seen as accessories that can be controlled by humans. However, although nuance is added to the story, the shift in paradigms begets more questions. How did Aaron get these powers and is he the only one that has them? The second plot point that handles propaganda and the administration of truth is one that pertains to the turmoil between the military police and Scott Regiment. The military before was seen as a force that was valiant and sought to protect the interests of humankind. However, with the introduction of the military police, that notion is proven to be the furthest thing from the truth. The military police are disgusting, corrupted, lazy, and self-interested. In fact, they couldn't care less about humanity, as many officers admit that they joined the ranks because of its low effort and lack of responsibility. Therefore, we gather that these individuals who are meant to be the heroes of society and renowned authority figures are nothing but. Instead, they are vile beings consumed by sloth and greed. Even when Hanji discovers someone tampered with her Titan experiments, Commander Irwin asks Eren who he thinks the real enemy is, implying that the Titans are not the sole threat to humans, but humans are as well. Thirdly, the next plot device that delves into the exploration of truths is the female Titan. With her athleticism and conscientiousness, Arma suspects the female Titan to be piloted by a human just like Eren. Furthermore, as a result of the female Titan's apparent knowledge of military intel, Eren suspects the female Titan to be a traitor amongst the military. And lastly, with the female Titan's use of steam, Hanji identifies the similarities the female Titan has with the colossal Titan, which leads to the hypothesis proposing that humans are also piloting the colossal Titan and armored Titan. Thus, more truths are revealed about the nature of Titans, but at the same time, more mysteries emerge that need to be uncovered. Still, alongside all these aforementioned plot points, the final adjunction of season 1 that stimulates the themes of propaganda is Eren's fight with the female Titan. Now this fight is not just a simple fight, but an unveiling of truths. Not only is Eren's fight with Annie done to apprehend her, it is also done to show the public the truth. To display the truth in front of them so that they can discern the truth for themselves. This public exhibition of brawling shifted titans exposes to the world what it really is. It exposes that the world that they lived in is fabricated on a foundation of lies and as a result, the truth or propaganda imposed by the government officials and nobility is fragmented. Thus, subsequent to this fragmentation, the authority that the government nobility and clergymen once possessed is weakened as the public grows to distrust them. So already in season 1, we see how propaganda is used in Isayama's work to sophisticate his story and world building. In the first episode, we see how the walls protecting the populace was a fallacy. Then we later find out that the military police are just corrupted dogs of the government. Then lastly, and more importantly, the discovery of shifted titans revealed new knowledge of the titan's nature. However, with these new discoveries come more complications as when new truths are discovered, more mysteries arise. Therefore, the paradigm of attacking titan has completely shifted from the beginning of the season to the end. Now. In season 2, the themes of truth and propaganda become even more prominent as the mysteries multiply. In addition, attaining the truth becomes the imperative motivation for our protagonist. One of the precursors for this motivation begins at Walsina, where Eren and Ani fought. The scout regiment are in the midst of excavating the battleground, when all of a sudden, a scout discovers a colossal titan inside the wall. Now this discovery is shocking enough as it is, but even more surprising is Pastor Nick's reaction to this discovery. Instead of showing expressions of surprise like the rest of the scouts, he urgently requests the scouts to keep the titan out of sunlight. With this reaction, Hanji gathers that the clergymen, government officials, and nobility know something that the public doesn't. Also, with Hanji's experiments on Ani's shell, she concludes that the materials found in Ani's armor 
are just the same as the ones used for the walls, which then causes Armin to amuse the notion of what if the titans have been protecting humans all along. Then following at the village Rakugo, the scouts do an investigation of the titans there. Once the investigation was completed, it revealed that the titans found in Rakugo were actually humans turned into titans, which concluded that the titan that spoke to Connie was in fact his mother. Now these discoveries expand the knowledge previously known about titans. At first, the titans were seen as these mindless menaces, but now it seems that their nature is much more complex. When they are seen inside the walls, and to contain the same components that built the walls, it infers that these titans acted as some sort of foundation that built the civilization. Moreover, the discovery at Rakugo further infers that the titans the humans fought all along were themselves. And lastly, it seems that the higher ups, the ones with influence and political power, knew all these secrets. Therefore, the people at the top controlled all the information, all the truths, and subsequently controlled all of society. Furthermore, the knowledge of titans is further expanded upon when Ymir reveals herself as a shifter. Then a couple episodes later, Raynor and Berthold reveal themselves as the colossal and armored titans with their goal being the eradication of humans. Raynor then tells Eren that if he comes home with them, a crisis will be averted and they could go back to their home. Raynor then confirms that Eren is indeed the coordinate they were looking for as Eren gains the power to command a slew of titans. Just like the first season, the second season brings upon answers to previous questions, but simultaneously with those same answers draw more questions, such as what is this crisis that Raynor wants to avert? What is this home he refers to? And who wants humans eradicated? Where do they come from? The walls? The outside? These are the truths that our protagonists must now uncover. Now lastly, the most important truth revealed in this season is that of Krista's true origin as Historia Rees, the true heir to the kingdom. This revelation affirms that the aristocracy held secrets that they definitely wanted to keep out from the public, and with the withholdment of information of great importance, they have the power to puppet society to their will. Hence, they only wanted to know what they wanted to know. Sound familiar? This does sound like some conspiracy Illuminati New World Order stuff, but this does occur in real life. Through distribution of information, the elites can control the public. With propaganda, they tell you who to fear, what to fear, and at times withhold information in order to not stir panic in the public. Isayama draws parallels from our real world to his world of Attack on Titan and uses it to world build and create tension for his characters. As a result, Eren and the Scout Regiment don't really know who the enemy is. At first, the answer was obvious, the Titans, but now it seems the answer is muddied as new facets arise. However, this uncertainty and lack of clairvoyance is what makes the story so compelling. So with season 3, we definitely know that the military police are in cohorts with the oligarchy. We also see how the oligarchy implements the military police to silence anyone who appears to resist their order. We see Pastor Nick get tortured and killed for his compliance with the Scout Regiment. We see in a flashback Erin's father killed by the military police for his questioning of the inconsistencies in the history texts available to the people. And lastly, perhaps most significantly, we see whenever the Scout Regiment gets close to the truth, they are met with more resistance from their authorities. At first, the resistance was only done politically, but soon, the tension between the Scouts and the government escalate to a whole civil war. This is significant because it answers the question of what would happen if the people were to discover the truth that the authorities wanted to keep confidential. In addition, what would happen if with the truth, the people grew to become discontent with their authority, but the authorities still wanted to maintain their order. Well, if history has taught us anything, the only things that result from these instances are rarely peaceful. Revolutions, civil wars, and coup d'etats occur. Moreover, 
With the exposition given by Rod Race and the flashbacks of Grisha Yeager, we gather the whole truth that the Titans are actually people and that they come from a race called Eldians. Furthermore, we learn that over a hundred years ago, there was a Titan war that resulted in the fall of the Eldian Empire. This fall resulted in the Eldian King to recluse himself and his followers to Paradis Island, and the Eldians left on Marley would be persecuted for generations to come, burdening the sins of their ancestors. The royal family fully accepted the demonization of their race and sought the atonement of their sins. With this resolve, the king erased the memories of his people and only the people who shared his royal bloodline would know the actual truth. Therefore, in order to atone for the sins of his people, the king distributed falsehoods and propaganda to make his people blind to the truth. With this lack of knowledge, the people can't resist his verdict. The less they know, the less they can do. Now this series of events puts our protagonist in the ultimate predicament at the end of season 3. The government is overthrown and the public knows the truth. There are no more secrets and what is left is a whole world of unknown enemies. This tiny world is about to change. Will it bring hope or despair? Can we trust the government with the future of humanity or not? Who gets to choose? Who gets to decide? Who will you trust? Now this excerpt by Irwin is fascinating because it proposes the question that even though what was propagated to society was lies, was living in ignorance more blissful? Now that the truth is learned, more problems arise from knowing it. A new government has to be formed, the order of the people has to be maintained in this new world order, and the threat of the unknown outside must be dealt with. This new arrival of problems is great because it shows consequences. It is not enough to know the truth. The most important part of discovering truth is what you do when the truth is revealed. Will you conform or will you resist? Well, the choice our heroes make is that of resistance, which by far is the most difficult choice. But there's still more to cover, and this video is already long as is. So I will release a part two to this to wrap up all my thoughts. If you watched this far into the video, I thank you, and I'll see you in the next part.